Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm here with Melissa McCaw, Renee Coleman Mitchell. Um, we'll be talking a little bit about uh, the budget today. i just give you a quick update on where we stand right now. Um, we just got the current numbers as regards infections. That's 267 additional positive tests for COVID out of 1,700 tests. Um, that's less infections, and that was a lot of tests. So it's a lower percentage of people infected as well. Uh, there were 61 hospitalizations, bringing a total of 827. And there were 27 deaths, bringing the total of 112. Uh, we took a second look at the numbers. Um, as regards folks who are infected, there's not that big a difference between men and women. As regards uh, fatalities, it skews towards uh, men being more likely. Perhaps there's some pre-existing conditions there. I'll tell you, in terms of the, the positives, you know, maybe going steady or a little down a little bit, the percentage, uh, I don't know what it means. And uh, Josh always reminds me, this is just two or three days of numbers. You can't jump to anything. But I do want to remind you, there's an enormous difference between um, Washington State and uh, New York City. And it just reminds you that uh, social distancing and taking all of those precautions can make a difference. And maybe we'll know in a week or so whether it's uh, beginning to make a difference in Connecticut. Um, we also have an, um, an executive order, which you may want to hear about, but we're trying everything we can to um, limit a lot of transportation um, throughout the state in intrastate, following on uh, the president's um, transportation um, advisory. So we're going to issue an executive order that says hotels and short-term rentals are reserved only for essential workers, not leisure travel, not vacationers, trying to uh, make sure that that is uh, not just prioritized, but exclusively for um, essential workers. And that goes into effect tomorrow. What I really wanted to do today is talk about this impact of the COVID pandemic on um, our budgets. When I say our budgets, that's the Connecticut state budget, that's the municipal budgets, and that's your budget. Uh, we are prepared for a lot in this state, uh, but nobody's prepared for the scale of what we have been confronted over the last uh, few months and what we can expect for at least the next few months. Um, Kurt Westby, our uh, commissioner, over in labor, just put it into some perspective for me during our um, unified command call. And he pointed out that we had 180,000 unemployment claims last year, 180,000. In the last 18 days, we've had 220,000. That's something like 20 times more the scale. And um, obviously we're struggling to keep up. There's a long wait on the on unemployment claims. Um, Kurt and the uh, tech team are working to find a workaround there. Obviously, we're throwing people at this as well. And uh, I hope to be able to show you some progress um, soon. And obviously, uh, same thing at the federal level. Uh, they have a lot of the old systems there. They've promised under the um, CARE Act, they call it, the $2.2 trillion federal bill that uh, was passed last week, um, an additional $600 per unemployment check for, um, you know, folks who have been uh, laid off or lost their job related to COVID and uh, for those gig workers. Uh, but it doesn't work if we can't get you the money. And uh, we, in working with the feds, are doing everything we can. I hope to get you a, a better response than I have so far uh, next week. Let me tell you just about the um, two, two and a half, trillion dollar CARE Act that was uh, passed by uh, Congress uh, about a week ago uh, and what it means to us. Uh, I'll tell you what it's not. It's, it's not a stimulus. It's not a traditional big infrastructure plan, get people to work, get out of the recession, traditional deficit spending. You know, what it is is a relief bill 
given the nature of the fact that our economy has uh, collapsed for um, you know, so much, as we just described, and ways to help those uh, folks get back on their feet and ways to help uh, small businesses power through. We'll be able to talk to you a little bit about um, what it means. You know, the first thing which we can get right, the feds are able to do this, is get out the, um, uh, the $1,200 checks. That's $1,200 uh, per person, $2,400 for a couple, uh, and $500 per child. And uh, Secretary Mnuchin um, thinks that we'll be able to get, start getting those checks out in a little over two weeks on April 17th. Um, we'll see, but uh, there's a better chance we can get those checks out sooner. It's a lot easier to do. The paid sick leave, you know about that from um, the second supplemental. And uh, that's available now. Uh, the paid sick leave is so important for anybody who's uh, not comfortable not going to work because they need that paycheck. We get you compensated right now, go. And your employer, by the way, gets a credit against his payroll taxes, her payroll taxes. So that is something that's available to you right now. Our hospitals, who have done such heroic effort, uh, are, um, are running on fumes in some cases, not just in terms of um, the protective gear, but also uh, in terms of cash. And fortunately, uh, most of our hospitals are in a very strong financial position like the state of Connecticut, but this um, can't go on forever uh, given the cash flow losses. There is um, $100 billion in the um, uh, federal bill, and that $100 billion uh, is going to be able to reimburse all of our hospitals and medical facilities for COVID-related expenses. You're going to hear that a lot, and the message is going to be quantify and document your COVID-related expenses. Uh, hospitals, um, that we still haven't even gotten the guidance from Treasury yet on, um, on that $100 billion. So um, Dan D. Simone, who is uh, you know, on the call here, he's our eyes and ears in Washington, D.C., and we'll get you guidance and information on uh, the how and the when for that $100 billion, you know, which our share of that is uh, you know, 1% or 2%. Um, you know, we'll be able to find that out hopefully within a week. Um, the Paycheck Protection Act, I mean, this is uh, really important. This is $350 billion. You know, this um, I had a strong interest in and worked with, um, you know, Len Vizzano, worked with uh, Chris Murphy and Dick Blumenthal, just to remind um, Congress that um, when you're a small business, less than 500 employees, and your revenues have disappeared, you don't need a loan because we don't have the ability to pay a loan. What you need is a grant, or at least what they call a forgivable loan, where if you keep people um, on payroll, they forgive that. And that's going to be forgiven um, after four months if you um, uh, don't lay people off. And um, what that means is that loan will pay for all payroll and benefits, all payroll and benefits, and that includes uh, health insurance. So what we did uh, yesterday with the health insurance companies for the two months grace period will feed right into this uh, loan period where you can continue to provide payroll and health insurance for your employees for at least four months. It includes rent or interest if you have a mortgage. It includes utilities. That's for, um, those are loans up to $10 million, companies up to 500 people. And um, I, I want you to know one thing, that uh, David Lehman, who um, runs Economic Community Development, they sent out guidance to all of our small business. I think it was Sunday. You can also go to ct.gov or go to um, the um, DECD website to get information. Tomorrow, the loan windows open up. And uh, by that, I mean you can go to your local bank or contact your local banker or find a local banker, uh, SBA bank, and uh, start documenting what your operating expenses are, payroll, rent, and utilities. And uh, prepare to put that um, proposal in, that loan um, request in tomorrow. Because there's no minimum or maximum amount that any state can get for the um, paycheck protection. But what we can do is urge you, get your application in thoroughly and early, and that will advantage you. And what advantages you advantages all of us here in the state of Connecticut. That's tomorrow. That opens up. Uh, as an aside, I can also tell you there's also an SBA, Small Business Administration, um, emergency grant program, up to $10,000. Apply for that uh, on the SBA site. 
that, has, uh, that can give you uh, $10,000 within 36 hours. $10,000, again, for small business. And I urge you to take advantage of that. Just because the rest of the federal programs, we can't uh, guarantee you how fast that comes. And uh, I want you to be prepared for that. There's also a refundable credit for um, folks you keep employed. There's also our shared work program. So if you go to the DECD website or ct.gov, we can show small business a lot of ways that you can keep your people on the payroll. Hopefully they're telecommuting, by the way. And to make sure that when we get on the back side of this uh, pandemic, we're ready to um, rev up the engines again and get going, starting with our small business. And uh, with that, I'm just going to talk briefly about our state and, and municipal budgets as regards the, um, the federal um, bill that came through. And, uh, and then I'll be able to pass it over to Melissa. But right now, um, our COVID relief fund, it looks like our allocation for the state of Connecticut uh, will be $1.45 billion. And all the governors together on both sides of the aisle worked to make sure that um, the states had um, some discretionary money with a lot of, not a lot of strings attached that we'd be able to put to work. And that's 1.5. Um, we're not going to get that any of that before April 27th or so, but um, we're well prepared. Other states are less well prepared in terms of um, cash flow issues. We're well prepared. I'll tell you what it doesn't do is it does not make up for revenue losses. So if you're a municipality or we as the state of uh, Connecticut, um, we've suffered a, a lot of revenue loss over the last couple of months and we foresee it through this uh, fiscal year and beyond. You know, I think last time I was here, we talked about probably um, a $60 million shortfall in this fiscal year, which was uh, very uh, small in the big scheme of things. I think uh, Melissa will tell you we're probably looking at about $500 million now uh, for the year that ends on June 30. Almost all of that, I don't know, 80, 90 percent of that is related to uh, income tax and sales tax revenue going down uh, for reasons that you well understand. And um, for a lot of our states, that's creating incredible hardship. They're going out in the markets. They're borrowing money short term. Um, they're being tough in terms of collections. and. Fortunately, because Connecticut um, has a rainy day fund and a, and a strong cash position, we've got um, the wherewithal, uh, at least through the end of this fiscal year, to be in pretty good shape. We have the wherewithal to make sure we can pay all of our bills uh, without um, hopefully having to go out into the short-term market. We have the wherewithal to be able to give um, uh, many of you um, a grace period in terms of paying your sales tax, in terms of paying your income tax, in terms of paying your corporate income tax, give us, uh, give you a little more breathing room going forward. So I really, you know, thank the legislature. I thank Melissa. I thank Sean Wooden, our treasurer, for holding the line and making sure that we have this strong cash position, including our rainy day fund. Um, and I think with that, I'm going to give you one last thought. This is the third supplemental. I think there will be a fourth supplemental. And what I'm thinking about, and what I hope the fourth uh, supplemental thinks about, is the day after, what we do um, going forward. And um, obviously, in terms of the revenue shortfalls, um, I think it's going to be very important that the next supplemental uh, at least reimburse us for some of the revenue shortfalls, because uh, that could be, um, especially for those states with no rainy day fund, that, that could break the bank. Uh, I, I tell our municipalities the same thing I tell small business. Document all of your COVID-related expenses and bring them up to us. So sometime by uh, early May, we may be able to make some reimbursements there. And um, let us know your cash position, because uh, obviously we don't get any reimbursement for lost revenues. And I also think the last piece of the supplemental coming up, I hope, in the next month or so, we'll look at infrastructure. We'll look at getting our economic engines going again. Uh, we'll look at what we can do in terms of putting people back to work, uh, roads and bridges and transportation and other needed infrastructure. So Melissa and I are going to be having our um, bond commission uh, meeting remotely next week, gets money to our municipalities, and also puts into place some really key design features so that hopefully we can be at the front of the line if this infrastructure bill comes through as part of the next supplemental. 
you know, with that, uh, let me ask Melissa, she can just give a little more breakdown of what this means to our budget. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Governor. Um, and um, I want to applaud you for your leadership as well as for the many, probably hundreds of state employees uh, that are helping to support our state through this crisis. Um, we are very fortunate with a robust um, stimulus package that came out of Washington. And so from the state's perspective, that has allowed us to, um, to stand up a very strong response um, items such as ensuring that we can fund an increase in Medicare, Medicaid services, as well as um, suspend any discontinuances for individuals that would otherwise fall off the program. We have expanded coverage and reopened um, enrollment time periods to cover more uninsured so that um, access to health care would not be a reason to not be uh, seen and tested in the event that there is a COVID concern. We've waived uh, Husky B co-pays. Um, we've waived co-pays related to um, pharmacy costs. We have um, provided a 10% increase to our nursing homes to ensure that they can support the additional cost um, to serve the residents, your loved ones, in their facilities, as well as supporting um, COVID-specific rates for um, facilities that will serve that population. We are in the process of um, expanding shelter services and decongregating shelters and providing alternate um, locations, and our funding from the federal government will help us to do so. We have also have additional funds available from a nutrition and fund uh, and food perspective. So the SNAP benefits, we have maximized um, the amount that can be given on a monthly basis. We provided an additional supplemental benefit. So those individuals that receive SNAP benefits, you are getting the maximum amount that is allowable um, under the federal program. For our nonprofit partners. Um, we have ensured stability in your payment stream. We're making all payments to um, nonprofits that receive grants, even if services aren't provided, to ensure that those employees continue to receive um, a paycheck. And those nonprofits that are paid based on a fee for service are sending in reports to DSS so that we can ensure they're receiving a grant as well. Um, so our response is very strong, um, and we have the resources to support that, thankfully, due to the federal stimulus bill. To the local municipality, um, there are resources in the federal stimulus bill. To our boards of education, your cost related to online learning or the event that you're going to need to have an uptick in some of your summer programming, um, there's funding that will be going to the local boards of education. Uh, there's an extension of benefits for the LIHEAP program that supports um, heating um, um, for gas and electricity, so direct payments to individuals that need that support. The federal government has provided additional funding. To our local police department, if you're incurring overtime expenses um, or additional equipment, um, there, are, there are new funds that will be available historically called the Justice Assistant Grants, but um, under a new terminology, but you have funding that will directly be coming to you to support um, any emergency response needs. Um, to our local municipalities that uh, often rely on the Community Development Block Grant to support uh, job training, workforce development, and shelter programming, there are additional CDBG funds that are going to our large urban municipalities and then to our smaller towns that funding comes through the state and then will be provided by a formula grant to our local municipalities. Um, obviously our higher education partners um, have incurred some impact because schools have closed and so there's funding in federal stimulus for both our public and our private colleges to help with some of the revenue loss in reimbursing families for meal plans and, um, and housing costs. Um, as well as to support more online technology for the delivery of distance courses. If you're in the local municipality and you provide rental subsidies, stimulus funding has um, funding coming to public housing authorities, um, as well as additional shelter funding. Um, so from a very broad perspective, the federal government has a, done a really good job to touch upon the key areas, whether it's food or child care, or even our community health centers that are part of our, our health care system. Um, so we will continue, obviously, to impress upon the delegation and, and to Washington that there's still a gaping need with respect to revenue loss. On a positive note for a local municipality, taxes are collected in July and January, but we do understand that there's still a revenue impact um, and we'll continue to push for um, some flexibility, if you will, in the fourth uh, stimulus bill. From the state perspective, as the governor indicated, 
Um, because of those strong cash balances, we were able to delay some of our tax receipts and also push out funding faster, for example, to local municipalities and also to nonprofits that were experiencing cash flow. We're expediting their fourth quarter payments. Um, and we're doing the same for our community health centers, federally qualified health centers, to our residential care homes or intermediate care facilities where they have additional costs. Um, we are using our cash flow to help um, support, support your needs. Um, from a uh, fiscal position of the state, it, it is strong. We do expect that we will incur an additional $130 million in Medicaid-related costs. Um, due to the federal government increasing some of our reimbursements on Medicaid, we will have additional funding coming in to support those costs. Our last fiscal estimate um, did not reflect the full impact of COVID. Obviously, that's un, um, that is increasing um, in each day as we determine what's necessary to protect and save lives here in the state of Connecticut. Um, we do project that um, in our next report, you'll see an increase. You'll see at least 100, uh, north of 100 million of uh, COVID-related costs that the state will have to bear. Some of these grants have a state share that we have to kick in. Um, but the real component that's driving the shortfall will be likely be revenue deterioration due to the impact on our economy. And as we see job losses, we expect some impact to our withholding, um, but also primarily in sales taxes as we have certain industries that are currently closed. Um, obviously, this is the rainy day, and this is the reason why we um, are well positioned to weather this storm. Um, we'll continue to monitor the extent to which this downturn will continue into the next fiscal year. Um, if we were to experience what occurred in 2008, we could see an, an additional significant draw on our rainy day fund. So we're making the um, progress that's necessary to protect our state governor and at the same time ensuring that we're able to weather the financial storm in the current year and the fiscal years to come. Well, thank you. And, and Renee is here if we have uh, public health related questions as well. Any questions? On uh, the baby's death, uh, we're hearing that we're still waiting for an autopsy. And I think a lot of parents want to know uh, if this was caused by the coronavirus. That situation, that case right now is still under investigation. And I can understand the concerns that many parents would have. But until we have further uh, definitive information, we're not at liberty to share anything at this time. Uh, Governor, on one of the budget things you mentioned, that basically, if I heard you correctly, a $500 million hit in the current fiscal year, if I heard you correctly. Uh, what would the hit be in the next fiscal year? Uh, obviously, that's a, that's a short-term number that you gave us based on what you know right now. Uh, what would the rollout be in the next year? We projected that at all? Uh, yes, yes, Governor, and thank you for the question. If, if we were to have an economic downturn similar to what we experienced in 2008, 2009, and we look back at that experience, um, the first full year, the impact was about $1.4 billion. And obviously, uh, recovering from an economic downturn takes multiple years. So we could see something up to $1.4 billion uh, correct, correct myself, in fiscal year 21, and then the extent to which we have to continue a COVID response or there are additional costs beyond um, the start of the fiscal year, that number could be, could be higher. Um, if you were to look back at our last economic downturn, it really took us four years um, to fully recover and bring our revenues back, and over that time frame, that was about $4 billion of impact. Add to that that we had economic recovery notes and we had st dollars that came in from the federal government and um, other programmatic measures. Um, so if we we're just thinking about fiscal year 2020, we're probably in the $1 billion range of what that shortfall could potentially look like. I, I would say, Chris, though, just um, this is not your garden variety recession, as I said before. And as Melissa said, what happened in 08, 09, what happened in the early 90s and other um, type recessions, you can have a slow comeback and that could impact revenues for uh, you know one, two, three years. Or you may say, we, had, we were a very strong economy up until the COVID shutdown. And it was a medical related shutdown of our economy that stopped things dead in their tracks. And whether we have a slow recovery or faster recovery would definitely impact uh, what uh, Melissa's numbers are she's talking about. That's why everything I focused on in terms of those small businesses and the such is do everything I can to keep them intact. So if there is demand coming out of this uh, medical shutdown, we're in a position to take advantage of it and get our economy growing faster. So 
If you get the $1.45 billion from, from the federal government on April 27th, um, will you have to, and I don't know if you need legislative approval for this, will you have to begin using um, the rainy day fund? Yeah, so even with the $1.4 billion, the um, guidance, uh, the preliminary information we have coming out of Treasury that will ultimately provide the specific guidance is that only reimburses for COVID-related expenses. And it has to be an increased expenditure greater than what was budgeted. So it will not cover any revenue loss. Um, and so um, the impact to the state for COVID cost is really anything that's required to match, but revenue deterioration would 100% come from the rainy day fund. I don't anticipate requiring um, an appropriation or legislative action. Uh, there is existing statutory uh, language whereby when the controller closes the books, if he determines that there was a shortfall, then um, that those costs would be covered from the resources of the rainy day fund. So that would automatically happen. And you guys plan to release some of the municipal funding um, at the April 8th bond commission meeting, which will happen by Zoom or remotely or? Great, so that, uh, that is happening through, it will be recorded through CTN and then is a teleconfer teleconference um, audio, if you will. Um, and yes, the funds will are, for all Muni aid, for Muni aid that is capital funded, um, all those large um, uh, and funding sources are on the bond agenda. And usually it takes about three to four business days thereafter for the funds to actually show up in the municipality's bank account. How are we doing on nursing homes? <clears throat> Do we have a number on nursing homes infected and plans for those? Mm -hmm. I know it was 30, I think. Well, <coughs> the data that I'm gonna to present to you is as of yesterday, as you know, we drop our numbers uh, about four o'clock each day. So um, as of yesterday, we had out of our 215 nursing homes, we had 57 that reported COVID-19 positive patients, right? So it's extremely alarming for us because this is the most, most vulnerable population uh, for us, and we're really just trying to address their needs, um, being the most vulnerable population. And that was, I think the last number was 30, and I might not remember correctly, so it went from 30 to 57? 57. 57 as of yesterday, and every day that we report out regarding our nursing homes, the numbers continue to increase. So what are you doing with, to kind of limit the risk, or I don't know if you can. So being that it's the most vulnerable population, right now we have like a basically a two-prong approach. One of the things that we're really trying to do is to separate the COVID-19 patients that are positive from our COVID-19 negative patients within the existing nursing homes. But we're also looking at opportunities to have alternate uh, care sites uh, for patients that may be um, if the facility is too small or the size of the facility that we may have other locations for putting some of our COVID-19 patients and relocate them. So those are the things that we're trying to do, really looking at the size and scope of the facility and addressing the needs of this community, uh, very specifically separating out the COVID-19 positives from the negatives. Is there a new list of nursing homes? Because the head of the Nursing Home Association said that the nursing homes identified yesterday in the press release were not accurate. I can only tell you what we get reported to us, and we do follow up. The, one of the key things that we're doing, besides our epidemiologists at uh, the Department of Public Health, we've signed on now with Yale School of Public Health to help us work with all the nursing homes, and so we get those reports daily, and we report oh, out. Not cases, just the homes the that home, would be yes. the standalone homes versus yes. the, the COVID positive homes versus the um, the COVID negative homes. Yeah, we have the list of those homes that we know of that have COVID COVID nineteen positives. We do. And also, frankly, do, do some of these nursing homes don't want to do this. In other words, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, an exclusive COVID positive 100 people in, in one nursing home. Yeah, there were five nursing homes identified yesterday as nursing homes that would be accepting COVID positive mm -hmm. patients. Keep and in mind, this is an existing situation where it is extremely fluid. It is fast and it's furious in regards to all of us trying to work to address the needs of this most vulnerable population. So we continue to work with the industry, with the Department of Social Services, uh, the Department of Aging and Disabilities, the Ombudsman, the, the, the administrators, the families, really to look at how we can address the needs of this community. So what we said yesterday could be very different as of today in regards to who's working with us to address those needs. So it could be more than just the five that were identified. What sort of message do you have 
have for those families, and the 23,000 or so families who have loved ones in these facilities, they're hearing their loved one's facility name yeah. thrown out there yeah. as a potential option. What sort of assurance do you want to give them tonight, reassurance tonight, that this mm -hmm. is going to be a process that's handled delicately and with their safety and health in mind? I can tell you this. As a commissioner of public health, my biggest concern is to address the needs of this most vulnerable population. I understand that these are loved ones. I have had loved ones in nursing home facilities. I understand that some of these individuals in the nursing homes, this is their home. But from a public health perspective, knowing that we're currently in a pandemic situation that we have never had before, uncharted waters, the biggest concern right now is to mitigate, to reduce the transmission that can occur. You've seen what has happened in the state of Washington and other states, and we are doing our best to work with everybody that we can to not become a situation where this transmission is like wildfire in our nursing homes for our loved ones. And so I can only say to those families, and it's heartfelt that I understand their concerns, what we're trying to do is to protect them as best as we can. And with that, our goal is to save their lives, ultimately. Just to clarify one point with Melissa, um, the 1.45 that you mentioned from the feds, if I understood you correctly, that was for COVID-related expenses. Is that the state only, or is that for the cities and towns too? Is that only for the state government is what I meant by that? The, the language that came out of um, the bill um, allows those funds to be used for state and local. State and local. That's but only correct. for the expenses, as you said. Direct COVID-related expenses, yes. Uh, since the commissioner is here, did you have any comments at all on the, the deputy commissioner uh, leaving the Department of Health at a time of uh, great importance and great uh, crisis, for lack of a better term? Uh, I don't have any comments on that right now. Right now in our state? It's a source of endless frustration for me. Uh, uh, we got 50 from the uh, feds uh, probably a week ago. We've got uh, the local manufacturer in Guilford who's uh, promised us 100 over a period of time. We're doing everything we can to help that um, company ramp up so they could go from maybe 50 to 100 to 500 um, uh, a week and we could get a larger share of that. Uh, I want to do everything I can to get that done in time. And all those numbers you see when you watch those, um, you know, press conferences in Washington, D.C., they say GM and Ford, they're going to be making ventilators, and they're all going to be available on the backside of that curve. That doesn't help me. So do we have a tally of how many we have right now in our state and then, like, what our target goal will be? We do. We had 973. We, then we got 50 from the feds. We got 10 from uh, the manufacturer. So we're going up slowly. And then the target for how many we want when the, when the virus peaks. Yeah, we were very um, clear on that. We did our analysis. That analysis was right two months ago. It's still right. And that is we needed 1,500 additional ventilators. Uh, as you heard from uh, Dr. Murphy um, from New Vance the other day, one of the two things that sort of surprised us, a higher percentage of patients need the ventilators than we had expected. That's the bad news. The good news is they're generally on the ventilators maybe 13 days as opposed to a full month, which was the example in Asia. Melissa, do you have any numbers on, also on the federal, of how many people, for example, in Connecticut would get the $1,200? In other words, senior citizens will get it, um, families, et cetera. Um, do you have a rollout on that? Not will, at this will time. Will a million people get a check for 1200 bucks? Not at this time. We don't have that data yet. No data on that. But Chris, if you did not file a tax return, you must file a, a brief expedited return now to make sure that you are eligible for that $1,200. I want to make sure those folks are not left behind. What's the status on the uh, backlogs of the uh, Department of Labor in terms of unemployment benefits? I think a lot of people are at home wanting to know when they might be able to get their checks. Do we have a timeline on that? Uh, right now, as we continue to throw more and more people at the um, uh, you know, unemployment claim processing, uh, this is going on around the country, and it's going on right here. And right now, that's a backlog of five or six weeks, and it's absolutely unacceptable. Uh, and so what we can do with people power, we're doing that right now. But as I alluded to, and, and give us uh, four or five days, 
We're working on an end around, working out with a fix that would allow us to have an expedited uh, process on this. We're working with some great partners from the private as well as the other departments here in the state to do everything we can to upgrade the system to make this expedited process work. And that could be cut back to a week. In other words, it's five, six weeks now. Uh, obviously, I'm sure you'd want to have it in a one-day turnaround, but what, what is your goal to, to get that to? My goal is to clear that backlog over, uh, you know, two or three weeks. But let's see if this works first. Do you know how many employees that they had initially, 20 employees working there three weeks before this crisis hit, they were able to ramp up to 70. Do you know how many employees they currently have processing That's right. claims? Uh, currently at this very moment there is a meeting underway to figure out how we can ramp up staffing. Some of the additional measures that we've taken is we've authorized a significant amount of overtime. Um, we've done a search of all of our prior retirees that have worked um, in any area of unemployment uh, claims processing. We're reaching out to see if they will come back uh, to work in this area. Ob obviously, they're already trained up. Um, and the commissioner continues to look at other employees within the department that um, could have some experience to support and receive a quick training. We're also looking across state agencies, employees that have, might have left DOL and gone into another state agency um, that could come back for a temporary period of time to assist. So at this point in time, there's a SWAT team, if you will, that's supporting the commissioner to explore all options um, to help increase staffing there. And Governor, have you also gotten any either local reports or any pushback on uh, the whole question of essential, non-essential businesses? In other words, have you got any pushback of, of businesses that are open that should not be open um, and have been open? The, the real worry I had was uh, perhaps some of those businesses are not respecting the uh, social distancing that we had required. And uh, that's why we put out, uh, I think it was yesterday, the executive order. We said um, for those businesses, um, large and small, you cannot have more than half the number of people allowed under the fire marshal um, uh, certification. And uh, I doubled down on that, and um, uh, Jim Ravella had state troopers actually go to, I don't know, dozens and dozens of these uh, retailers to take a look and make sure that they are respecting those parameters. And I'll tell you, in the overwhelming majority of cases, I was very happy that people are respecting those cases. In a few numbers, they weren't. And there were uh, some uh, more people than were allowed in there, and they got a friendly talking to. Um, you're there expecting won't be a friendly talking to next time. Um, you're expected to um, sign another executive order tonight. Um, is there anything else that's going to be in it that we haven't chatted about? Uh, not that I know of right now. Okay. If that's pretty complete. Are we still expecting a surge in Connecticut's hospitals? And if so, is there any more insight into what those numbers are looking like? Yeah, I, I, you know, we've had some interesting news as regards uh, the infection rate you know over the last three or four days we're following that carefully but more importantly um, if it's the mild case or it's the severe case we need more hospital beds so whatever it is we are ramping up we're adding on additional capacity we're encouraging volunteers we're encouraging the medical health care corps to come and join up we need those people on board we know we're going to need them and any new numbers on volunteers who have stepped up the last numbers I had was 3,400, 3,300, something like that. And to be blunt, we've got to now go through that list of volunteers, check their certifications, see what their uh, strengths are. Governor, yesterday you mentioned that there was conversation going on about potential uh, other locations across the state that might be considered for some more of the mobile hospitals. Has there been any further communication or decisions yet made on any more of those uh, additional resources? Um, all I can tell you is FEMA and the Army Corps are, are scouring the state right now, finding additional facilities. We'll have more to be able to announce on that uh, by next week. And uh, they've been good. They've been uh, proactive on this. It was amazing what they did at Southern. They got those 200 beds in there in like four or five hours. With the lower numbers in eastern Connecticut, do you think you're going to be needing the, the Mohegan Sun <laughs> Convention Center? Or what will, will you be needing that? Well, the reason we, we put together the consortium of the uh, hospital leaders is so they have a statewide perspective on what we need in terms of hospitalization. And my answer to that, I think, is going to be yes, because right now we're getting closer to capacity in our hospitals in the southern part of the state, and we have some capacity in the northern part of the state. So be it equipment and people, we can move around. And as I said the other day, it could be reversed in a month.
Thank you, everybody. Appreciate you being here.